This is going to be a study showing you how the post-trib, pre-wrath rapture is unbiblical. And there will be no mockery in this study. I will not be calling people stupid or saying that people are lost. If you think someone is lost because of where they put the rapture, I think that's a much bigger problem than believing wrong on the rapture. I never want, want to make this a pride issue. I mean, I know it's Pride Month or whatever they're calling it, but uh, there nobody has any right to be prideful about something that they believe. There are prideful people on both sides. And just because somebody believes different on the rapture, if, if they're saved, then they are your brother in Christ. And I don't believe the rapture position, if somebody believes different on it, I don't believe that gives you a right to even break fellowship with that person. But I want to show you how this post-trib, pre-wrath rapture doctrine is wrong. And if you know me, you know I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And I want to make that clear why I believe that. I don't just believe that because that's what my pastor teaches or because that's what I've just always believed. I believe it because I believe that's what the Bible teaches. So the first thing I really want to talk about is Matthew 24. One of the most common places that they go to teach the post-trib pre-wrath theory is Matthew 24. And I'm going to show you very plainly how Matthew 24 speaks of a time that takes place after the church. All born-again believers make the church. It speaks of a time when the church, which is his body, has already been raptured out. Those who believe in a post-trib, pre-wrath rapture believe that our rapture is in Matthew 24. So I'm going to tell you why I don't believe that our rapture is in Matthew 24. I'm going to give you some quick reasons why I believe Jesus Christ is describing a time that has to take place after our rapture. Okay, Matthew 24, 3, it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives... The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So first off, these are Jewish disciples before the cross. It is before Acts 2, so it's before the church became an organism. And the church is not even being spoke of prophetically here either. Also consider they ask, What shall be the sign of thy coming? Who is it that requires a sign? 1 Corinthians 1.22 says the Jews require a sign. Me and you, as born-again believers, we walk by faith, not by sight, according to 2 Corinthians 5.7. I'm not looking for signs in the heavens that Jesus is about to come and get me in the rapture. I'm looking for him through faith. Then in Matthew 24, 4 through 14, you have Jesus describing the beginning of sorrows. And this would be the first half of the future tribulation period. Those who believe in a post-trib, pre-wrath rapture believe that we are here for the beginning of sorrows, which we're not. And then you get into Matthew 24, 15, where Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation. And this is where the Antichrist stands in the temple claiming to be God. The verse says in Matthew 24, 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And it talks about this same event in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Talking about the Antichrist, it says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And right here, in them two verses, is another proof that the church is not here for this. It's because Jesus calls the physical temple the holy place. In 2 Thessalonians 2.4, it calls it the temple of God. But today, during this current age we are in, there is no physical building that's holy. There's nothing holy about a church building. During this age we are in, the temple is the body of the believer. And if we go through the tribulation, that goes in conflict 
with there being a temple called the holy place or something called the temple of God that's not us. I mean, the temple of God is, is, is in, we are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So your body is the temple. A physical temple pops back up in that future tribulation time period, which is Daniel's 70th week, because God once again begins to deal with the nation of Israel. And as much as these guys go against the fact that Matthew 24 is speaking to Israel, you find clues that it is all the way through the chapter. And they, they really love to mock and try to uh, poke fun at the fact that we believe Matthew 24 is about Israel. And this is done because they don't have any facts to prove that it's not about Israel. So therefore they have to mock us and dig up dirt on us and things like that because they don't have they don't have any way to prove that it's not about Israel. I mean that the fact that the Antichrist stands in a physical temple that proves that it's going back to God dealing with Israel in that future time period. Then look at Matthew twenty four sixteen. It says then then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Why point out Judea? That's another clue. Then Matthew twenty four twenty. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. If Matthew 24 is to the church, then why does Jesus Christ speak of the Sabbath day? I'm under no obligation to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath observance comes back because Jesus once again begins to deal with the nation of Israel. But today, I'm under no obligation to keep the Sabbath. Paul tells us in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Now look at this which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. So you see that the Sabbath days are a shadow of things to come. God goes back to dealing with Israel. God's not done with Israel. And they're going to have to observe the Sabbath once again. And if we're still here, that's in conflict with us because we are under no obligation to keep the Sabbath. Matthew 24 is obviously to Israel, not to us. Now, Matthew twenty four twenty two, it says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, the phrase, the elect's sake, those who teach in a post-trib pre-wrath rapture want to make the elect to be the members of the body of Christ, born-again believers, me and you. And I certainly do not deny that me and you are elect. Colossians 3, 12 verses like that shows us that we are elect. But the thing is that we aren't the only ones who are called elect in the Bible. Jesus Christ is called elect in Isaiah 42, 1. We are called elect, as I said in Colossians 3, 12. And Israel is also called elect in Isaiah 45 and verse 4. So when you see the elect, the word elect you have to look at the context and find out to which elect it's referring to. And the problem that they come to is that they want to make the elect of Matthew 24 to be me and you when the entire context refers to a time period where God's dealing with Israel, who is also called elect. I mean, if I'm seeing temple worship, if I'm seeing Sabbath days, people in Judea, Jewish disciples discussing signs when the Jews require a sign, then, I mean, the context is very Jewish. So why would I make the elect of Matthew 24 to be born-again Christians in the body of Christ when the context points to Israel? I believe that that's dishonest Bible study to say that the elect in Matthew 24 is me and you. So why would I make the elect of Matthew 24 to be born-again Christians in the body of Christ, who Paul says are neither Jew nor Greek, 
but are one in Christ Jesus. That is dishonest Bible study, and it tricks the people into believing that they're going through the tribulation. So they teach the elect in Matthew 24 is referring to believers who are in Christ. And since the verse says, For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened, then to them this means me and you go through the tribulation. But they have to realize there's more than one elect and that the context shows it is Israel. You can't just make the elect whoever you want it to be in Matthew 24. You have to look at the context and find out which elect it's referring to. And I think that is the most honest way to handle it. None of us are geniuses. None of us are ultra spiritual. We don't have all the answers. But I believe that is very clear in the chapter. Something else that they teach is that the Lord's coming in Matthew 24 is not the same as his coming in Revelation 19. And if you are familiar with the book of Revelation, then you probably know that Revelation 19 is one of the greatest chapters in your Bible on the second coming. However, they say Revelation 19 is not the second coming and that it is not the same as the event, as the coming in Matthew 24. They will even go as far as saying that nothing in Revelation 19 even resembles what you're about to read in Matthew 24. But I'm going to show you that that's wrong. It says in Matthew 24 and verse 24 through 28, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, gone not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now look at this. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Okay, so this coming refers to when Jesus Christ comes back down out of heaven with the saints, with us. On white horses. So we have already been raptured out. Before this even happens. And have been up in heaven with the Lord. At this point. And Jude 14. Says an Enoch also the seventh from Adam. Prophesied of these saying. Behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. What's happening in Matthew 24. 24 through 31. Is you're seeing the coming. Where Jesus Christ comes back with us. And this is the same event that happens in Revelation 19. When Jesus Christ, when heaven's open and Jesus Christ comes down on a white horse with us behind him on white horses. But they claim that Matthew 24 doesn't resemble the coming of Revelation 19 at all. But look at Matthew 24, 28 once more. It says, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So at this coming... In Matthew 24, 28, you have the eagles gathered together on the carcasses. This is a perfect match to the coming in Revelation 19. Look at Revelation 19, verses 11 through 18, and I hope you'll get your Bible or get East, pull up Esword on the computer and read this with me. I want you to see that I'm not lying. I'm not just trying to defend a doctrine because of a pride issue. I'm trying to show you the absolute truth according to the Bible. Revelation 19.11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Look at this. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. There you have it. Just like Matthew twenty-four, twenty-eight. For wheresoever the carcass is, 
There will the eagles be gathered together, matching Revelation 19, 17, and 18, where it says, to the, where the angel says to the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them. This is honest Bible study. I'm not trying to spiritualize anything or trying to like make it just vanish. I took you to Matthew 24. I showed you clearly Matthew 24, 28, how it matches Revelation 19, 17, and 18, showing you that it is the same event. It does, in fact, have things that match between the two chapters. It's not two completely different events. And just this fact right here that I've showed you destroys the post-trib pre-wrath rapture theory because they're relying on on this being two different events they are relying on this being event that takes place before revelation 19 and if it doesn't and it's the same event but in, if, if it's really our rapture in matthew 24 and it's the same event as revelation 19 then they would have to become just post post-trib and just believing that the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation. It destroys their whole theory. But we know, if you're a Bible believer and you've been in the Bible long enough, you know that the rapture happened way before these events in Matthew 24 and Revelation 19. Revelation 19, 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh, it's the same event. The eagles gathering together in Matthew 24 are obviously the fowls that are gathered together in Revelation 19, 17, and 18. And they're obviously eating the carcasses of the dead enemies of God. I just don't see how you can honestly overlook this. The new IFB claims that the eagles gathering together has to do with the rapture. And I heard one of them claim that the carcass... In Matthew 24, 28, listen to this. If your mind's drifting off, listen to this. They say the carcass is the dead in Christ. And they say the eagles are gathering to them together. So they use this to link it with 1 Thessalonians 4. They believe the carcass is the dead in Christ. They believe the eagles are the angels gathering together the elect. So they link it with 1 Thessalonians 4 where the dead in Christ rise first. They say that Matthew 24, 28 is just in poetic form. This is a complete private interpretation and by far the most disappointing and silly part of their teaching, in my opinion. They had to twist Matthew 24, 28. That verse alone links it with Revelation 19 and destroys the whole post-trib pre-wrath system. I mean, it could be over at this point. Because Matthew 24 speaks of the second coming when Jesus Christ comes back with the saints and not when he comes back to get the saints. Their whole system is built around a false teaching on those verses in Matthew 24. Even the first use in the Bible of the word carcasses had to do with fowls trying to eat the body of a dead animal in Genesis 15:11. It's not to say that the carcass is the dead in Christ and the eagles or the angels gathering together is a very bad private interpretation. That's very dishonest Bible study. In Matthew 24, 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now this is where they put the rapture of believers who are in Christ. Even though we just seen how it matches Revelation 19, where it's obviously where Jesus Christ comes back with us out of heaven. But they say this is where we are raptured. So they can constantly emphasize the phrase immediately after the tribulation of those days. And they say it over and over and over again. They say, see, the rapture is after the tribulation. It's after the tribulation. It's after the tribulation. But what is happening in the chapter, what is happening immediately after the tribulation of those days? We're not denying that something's happening after the tribulation. I mean, that's what the verse said. But it's not the rapture. 
as we've already talked about, it is the second coming where the Lord is coming back with us and carcasses are being devoured by fowls at this time. They teach that when you see the sun being darkened and the moon not giving light, then you know the rapture is about to happen. You know why? They're looking for signs. Matthew twenty four thirty, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And they say the tribes here have nothing to do with the twelve tribes. They hate the idea of what we teach about the rapture. Since we teach that the rapture is an event where everyone on earth sees the Lord coming, or excuse me, since we teach that the rapture is not an event where everyone on earth sees the Lord coming in glory and power. See, when the rapture happens, I don't believe that everybody is going to see the Lord in the clouds when we go up to meet him in the air. So they constantly mock and poke fun at that. They also take Revelation 1-7 and claim that it refers to our rapture because they believe at our rapture that everybody... They believe that everybody is going to see the Lord. And they take it to Revelation 1, 6 and 7, where it says, And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now look at this verse. They take you here and they say, This is our rapture. And they say, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So they claim this is our rapture. When the Lord comes to catch us away, and that every eye shall see him. Even though this verse is obviously referring to his second coming when he comes back with us and he comes down to smite the nations. Obviously, everybody's going to see him at that point. And notice verse 6 says, To whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. Putting verse 7 in the context of when he comes to get glory and dominion forever and ever. That is at the second coming. That is Revelation 19. This is when all the tribes of the earth mourn. And when they look on him whom they have pierced, as Zechariah talks about. Now it says in Matthew twenty four thirty one, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So you see that the elect are gathered together. So since they believe, as we talked about, the elect of Matthew 24 is me and you, the elect of Colossians 3.12. They therefore say we are gathered together in Matthew 24.31. And this is immediately after the tribulation of those days. So they, see, they say, see, our rapture is after the tribulation. But they have to make Matthew 24 refer to a different event than Revelation 19, which it doesn't. And they also have to make the elect of Matthew 24 refer to us which it doesn't because the context proves the elect is Israel. So you see how they're very deceptive in this way. They get you to believe it's a different event than Revelation 19, and they get you to believe that the elect is the elect, which is me and you, which it's not. And it says in Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now this verse is obviously referring to the second coming, when he comes back with us on white horses, and they point out the fact that many pre-tribbers will say Matthew twenty four thirty one refers to the second coming, which it does. But then a lot of them will say Matthew twenty four forty four refers to the rapture. And they are correct in that this is very inconsistent on a pre-tribber's part to make Matthew twenty four forty four to refer to the rapture and Matthew twenty four thirty one refer to the second coming. However, this doesn't disprove the fact that the pre-tribulation is correct just because some pre-tribbers may cherry-pick verses and because maybe they're not as studied up on this, on this topic as they are or other people. I've never believed our rapture is in Matthew 24, period, or the church. Something they also like to point out about pre-tribbers like us is that since we believe the Lord comes back to get us in a rapture, and then we come back with him at the second coming. They say, that <coughs> they say that we believe in two different comings. Or that our rapture to us, the rapture is a coming 1.5. The 
they say that the first rapture is the coming 1.5, and then we believe in a second coming. So they mock us and attempt to make us look stupid because of that. You can say the second coming is in two parts if you like. I mean, that makes sense. In one part, he comes back to get us. The next part, he comes back with us. So they believe that our rapture, when, when we refer to it, they say, well, they believe in a rapture 1.5 and then the second coming. But something inconsistent about them saying that is they also believe something similar. Because if they make Matthew 24 different from Revelation 19, they have him coming to get the saints in Matthew 24, and then the Lord coming back down in Revelation 19. So, I mean, if in Revelation 19, heaven opens and he comes down, they also believe in two comings. So there you go. Now, Matthew 24 the next thing we're going to talk about is Matthew 24 is not 1 Thessalonians 4. The post-trib pre-wrath guys make Matthew 24 the same event as 1 Thessalonians 4. That is the next thing I'd like to point out. Matthew 24 looks like a completely different event to me. A lot of pre-trib guys like Sam Gipp and Brian Denlinger, who made great arguments for the pre-tribulation rapture, started saying... Things that are different are not the same, and I agree with that. Both chapters look completely different, and things that are different are not the same. There is a much bigger similarity between Matthew 24 and Revelation 19 than there is Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4. However, they make those two events different instead, the post trip pre-wrath guys. They make Matthew 24 to be different than Revelation 19. So before we really get into this part, let me refresh your memory. Matthew 24 is not 1 Thessalonians 4. Revelation 19 is not 1 Thessalonians 4. But Matthew 24 and Revelation 19 are the same event. And the crazy, crazy thing is that one of these men who teaches the post-trib pre-wrath doctrine went to 1 Thessalonians 4 to prove that Revelation 19 wasn't Matthew 24. So he pointed out the differences between Revelation 19 and 1 Thessalonians 4 to prove that Revelation 19 wasn't Matthew 24. That is a mess. That is taking the fact that Revelation, or that's taking the fact that 1 Thessalonians 4 and Revelation 19 aren't the same, which that's true, but they did that to prove a lie that Revelation 19 and Matthew 24 aren't the same because they're trying to teach you that 1 Thessalonians 4 is Matthew 24. That is deceptive for someone who is new in the scriptures. The post-trib pre-wrath believers attempted to mock the saying of things that are different are not the same. Because, you know, the pre-trib guys say that a lot, and they want to mock that. They went to the Gospels and pointed out that you have differences in the crucifixion accounts, and yet they are all the same event, which is true. But you can use this example for two chapters that are talking about two completely different things can you do that i mean there isn't any similarity at all between matthew 24 and first thessalonians 4 yet they're saying it's the same event just giving that it's just two different accounts and giving different details on both accounts let's examine the two go back and look at matthew 24 once again matthew 24 27 and let's examine the two events and see if they're anything alike, period. Can you just take these two events and say, well, it's the same event, it's just giving different details in each account. Matthew twenty four twenty seven through 31. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other." Completely different event. Now here's a list. 
a list of things that Matthew 24 has that 1 Thessalonians 4 doesn't have. Number one, lightning. Number two, eagles gathered together on carcasses. Three, sun darkened. Four, the moon darkened. Five, the stars fall. Six, heavens are shaken. Seven, the tribes mourn. Number eight, it says they see the Lord. Number nine, he comes with power and great glory. Ten, he sends his angels. So there is at least ten things First Thessalonians 4 doesn't have. Yet they say they are the same and just different accounts like the Gospels give different accounts of the same event like the crucifixion. Now let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. You tell me, honestly look at it and tell me, is this the same event as Matthew 24? It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Here, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it mentions the dead saints. When Jesus Christ comes back in the rapture, he brings the souls of the dead saints, and their bodies will come out of the graves. Now, where are the dead saints rising and the souls coming with the Lord in Matthew 24? You don't see that. And here in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel. In Matthew 24, he sends his angels to gather the elect. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it doesn't give the hint that angels are gathering us, but rather that we are rising up to meet the Lord in the air. It doesn't say anything about any catastrophic events like Matthew 24 does. It doesn't mention anything about the sun and moon being dark. And I realize and believe that the Bible can give multiple accounts of the same event and that those accounts can have things that the other account doesn't have. However, you can't just take two passages that are completely different and say they are the same because sometimes the Bible just gives multiple accounts of the same event with different details in each account. I mean, then you could just mess up the entire Bible. If you did that for everything, you could make anything you wanted the same. I mean, just... You just got to use a little common sense and honesty. 1 Thessalonians 4 is different than Matthew 24. Also read 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, which also speaks of our rapture. It explains how our bodies will be changed and also mentions the dead being raised incorruptible. Matthew 24 doesn't mention these things. And it mentions a lot of other things in Matthew 24 that makes it obviously a completely different event. It's not our rapture. And at the same time, Matthew 24 does resemble Revelation 19, as we've already talked about. Not only does the chapter mention the fowls gathering together, just like in Matthew 24, but it describes an event that will be completely out in the open and seen by everybody. This is, this is the event where every eye shall see him. Not, it, that's not like that at our rapture. Every eye is not going to see him at our rapture. But at the second coming, he's coming down clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. It's a completely different event. He is coming with a sharp sword that smites the nations. Every eye is going to see that. While Matthew 24 may have diff some different details than Revelation 19, it's... Uh, there's details in it showing you the same event, and this obviously shows you a great example of how there can be more than one account of the same story with different details in each one, just like you got the Gospels, and they give the crucifixion story, giving you different details, but it's the same event. But you can't say that with Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4. That doesn't work. They do conflict. Now, 
We're still going to be focusing on Matthew 24, mostly 27 through 31. And now we're going to look at Revelation 6, 12 through 17. And I'm going to talk about the fact that Matthew 24, 27 through 31 is the same event as Revelation 6, 12 through 17. Something that they have right, the post trib pre wrath guys have this right, that both of those are the same event. This is something they have right that a lot of pre-trib believers don't even have right. The fact that both of those passages are the same event. A good portion of pre-trib believers believe the book of Revelation is completely chronological and in perfect sequence from chapter 1 to chapter 22. However, it's not. It actually gives at least four different accounts of the second coming in the book of Revelation. The post-trib pre-wrath crowd does understand that these two passages are the same event. It's just they've got it screwed up about what this event is. They make both of these places refer to our rapture. They say in these two places, this is where our rapture would take place. In Revelation 6.12, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So you see the sun becoming black, the moon becoming blood. That matches Matthew 24, where the sun and moon are dark, and showing you that it's the same event. That matches Matthew 24, 29. So look at Matthew 24, 29, and match that up. Then Revelation 6, 13, And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So this also matches Matthew 24, 29, because the stars of heaven fall. Then it says in verse 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Now pay close attention to that. These men are going to hide themselves in the dens and rocks of the mountains. And why are they hiding? Because they see the Lord. Every eye shall see him. Just like in Revelation 1-7. Just like in Matthew 24-29. It's an event where every eye is going to see it. And just like in Revelation 19. When heaven's opening and he comes down to smite the nations. All three of these are the same event. Revelation 6. 16 and 17. And said to the mountains and rocks fall on us. And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now this is where the post-trib pre-wrath believers really make a bad mess of things again. Because in this chapter you had the seals, and the Lamb opening the seals. What they teach is that the wrath of God isn't poured out until Revelation 6.17 so they say their teaching doesn't confl conflict with verses like 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, where it says we're not appointed to wrath and that the Lord's delivered us from the wrath to come. So they teach that their position doesn't conflict with these two verses because since this matches Matthew 24, where they have placed their rapture, then to them this proves they are still out of here before the wrath hits. So they call themselves post-trib pre-wrath. They believe they go through the beginning of sorrows, but they don't believe the, the wrath takes place until later on. So they say they are post-trib. They go through the trib, but they don't go through the wrath. So they're post-trib pre-wrath. They do not believe the church goes through the wrath of God. And I don't either. But I don't believe that the church goes through the trib or, the, or any wrath. They teach up until this point that it has been the wrath of men. So they do not believe the day of his wrath or the day of the Lord are phrases that have to do with the second coming, but rather have to do with the rapture of me and you. And this is a mess because the day of the Lord primarily refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ in the Bible. But they say the second coming is only the rapture. But what the day of the Lord refers to is when Jesus Christ comes back out of heaven to smite the nations. Specifically, when he comes back with us to take over and smite the nations with a vengeance. 
Also remember that the day of the Lord in your Bible covers more than a single day. And that is plain. Second Peter 3 8 says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. With the day of the Lord in the context. It covers more than one event. But primarily it refers to Jesus Christ coming back with us to smite the nations. And I want to prove that to you. So. I'm going to show you a place in your Bible that refers to the same event as Revelation chapter 6 that we just looked at and Revelation 19, which we've already looked at, and Matthew 24, 27 through 31, which we've already looked at. Look at Isaiah chapter 2, and you're going to see men hiding in the rocks, just like they were in Revelation 6. Remember, they were afraid of the Lord, and they're hiding in the dens and rocks of the mountains. Now look at Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 17. Now in Isaiah chapter 2, you're going to see people hiding in the dens and rocks of the mountains, showing you it's the same event. So in Isaiah 2, 17 here, we're talking about the same event. It says, And the loftiness of men shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, showing you this has to be at the end of the entire Daniel's 70th week. In that day here has to refer to when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming at the end of Daniel's 70th week because it refers to the day there are supposedly, it refers to the day when the Lord alone is exalted. If it can't refer to some type of pre wrath rapture where someone is taken out around close to the middle or after the middle of the tribulation. If it did, then that wouldn't make sense because there would still be a day after that when the Lord isn't exalted. The Antichrist will still be exalting himself because he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. You see what I'm trying to say here? Isaiah 2.17, when it says the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, this has to refer to the end because if it's in the middle or sometime shortly after the middle, there's still going to be someone else other than the Lord being exalted. So this can't, this can't be anywhere else but at the end. Isaiah 2 is speaking of a time when the Lord alone shall be exalted and the men are going to throw down their idols because they can't save them. That would include the Antichrist, who is the idol shepherd, according to Zechariah eleven seventeen, And then in the very next verse, Isaiah 2, 18, And the idols he shall utterly abolish. The Lord, when he comes back to smite the nations, he's going to utterly abolish the idols. This is a killer if you're teaching that Revelation 6 is not the second coming where Jesus Christ comes to literally take over. Because at this time, in Isaiah 2, 18, he's going to, the idols are abolished. The Lord Jesus Christ comes down in flaming fire taking vengeance. And the post-trib pre-wrath crowd doesn't believe Revelation 6, 17 is that time. But it is that time because it matches Isaiah chapter 2. They think it is simply the start of his wrath. And they think Revelation 19 is a completely separate event that happens later. So they think Revelation 6, 7, and 8 are chronological. If that is true... If Revelation 6, 7, 8, and 9 are chronological, and in Isaiah 2 it says the idols are abolished, then why are people still worshiping idols in Revelation 9? Revelation 9, 20 says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. So these people... Even after all this stuff happened to them, they still won't repent of the works of their hands and their idols and their worshiping of devils. And so if this was an event that took place after Revelation 6, and that in 6, 7, and 8, and 9 are chronological, the idols wouldn't have been there. Because Isaiah 2.18, it says... The idols are utterly abolished. This proves Revelation 6, 17 
is not just the beginning of some wrath. It's the first account of the second coming of Christ in the book of Revelation, and not simply just the start of his wrath. I mean, his, his wrath isn't just limited to that certain event. That is the great day of his wrath, but there was wrath before that. Look at Isaiah 2.19. And then it proves it's the same event as Revelation 6. And it proves that the book of Revelation has given us more than one account of the tribulation and second coming. Isaiah 2.19, it says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for, the, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So you got them hiding in the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth, just like in Revelation 6. Isaiah 2.20, in that day. There's that phrase. That's the day of the Lord. That's the day of his wrath. In that day. A man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rock and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So what you have in Isaiah 2, 18 through 21, the Lord, the Lord alone is going to be exalted because the people realize their idols can't save them. The Antichrist isn't going to be exalted. He's about to be cast into the lake of fire. This shows this is the end of Daniel's 70th week. It's the end of the tribulation. Just like Revelation 6 gives you the first account of the tribulation and second coming, and people are going into the rocks, the idols are going to be abolished, showing you that Revelation 6 gives you the first account of the tribulation and second coming Revelation 7, it's a parenthetical chapter there. And then Revelation 8 begins with the seventh seal. But that doesn't mean it's chronological. It's, it's, it's laying it out how John got the revelation. Not at how, in order of how the events happen. It's in order of how John got the revelation. It's in order of how it was revealed to him. So the seventh seal... We'll, we'll, we'll begin another account of the, tribul of the tribulation. What you have in Isaiah 2 is the same event as Revelation 6, 12 through 17, Matthew 24, 27 through 31, and Revelation 19, 11 through 21. This is the second coming when Jesus Christ comes back with the saints, not when he comes back to get the saints. The next thing, they deny the imminency of the rapture. Obviously, since they believe there will be signs of his coming in the rapture, signs as in the sun and moon and stars and the events of the tribulation, they believe those things have, have to happen first so they don't believe it could happen at any moment. They believe those things that have to happen first and that the Antichrist has to show up first, even though it says... Clearly in the Bible, the Jews require a sign. There's going to be signs in that future tribulation time period. But 1 Corinthians 1.22 says the Jews require a sign, not the church. It's not the church that requires a sign. They also make it seem as if the pre-trib rapture doctrine relies on imminency, which has to do with the rapture could happen at any moment. But it doesn't rely on that. If you disprove imminency somehow, you still don't disprove a pre-tribulation rapture. I mean, I believe it could happen at any moment, personally. But there are plenty of pre-trib guys who don't believe that it's imminent. And yet, they're still pre-trib. The post-trib pre-wrath crowd will take you to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. So they teach that Paul is saying that if you believe the day of Christ is at hand, then you are deceived just like the Thessalonians. They say if you believe the rapture could take place at any moment, then you are deceived just like the Thessalonians were. Now, I do believe the day of Christ refers to the rapture, but it also refers to the judgment seat of Christ that takes place after the rapture. Remember that. 
They make the day of the Lord and the day of Christ refer to the exact same thing. However, when you search the day of Christ, when you search these things out, it shows you that the day of Christ is used when referring to end times events for the church, like the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. Well, the day of the Lord is primarily used for the second coming. So while I do believe the day of Christ refers to the rapture, I also believe it refers to the judgment seat of Christ. And see what's going on in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is that Thessalonians were getting letters from people claiming to be Paul and saying that the resurrection is past already. So now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. So they're saying, see, the Thessalonians, they were deceived and they thought that the rapture was about to happen at any moment. And they were shaken in mind and troubled. This doesn't make sense. Listen, if the Thessalonians thought the rapture was about to take place, then why would they be shaken in mind? Why would they be troubled? <clears throat> to say that the Thessalonians were troubled by the rapture being about to take place makes no sense. Paul said in three chapters previous to this in 1 Thessalonians 4 to comfort one another with these words referring to the rapture. Why would they be upset about thinking the rapture was at hand? It's not that they were deceived into thinking the rapture was about to happen at any moment and were therefore worried about it. The day of Christ refers to the judgment seat of Christ as well. They thought the judgment seat of Christ was at hand, about to take place or taking place. And if the judgment seat of Christ was about to take place, then they missed the rapture. They thought their resurrection was past already and that they were, they were about to go into the tribulation and then face Jesus Christ coming back down in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Now, as I said before, I don't limit the phrase day of the Lord to one single event. Since a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day, as it talks about in Second Peter 3. And you can find in the Bible where events of the tribulation, the second coming, the millennium, and God making a new heaven and new earth and the great white throne judgment are referred to as the day of the Lord. But primarily, it refers to the second coming, where Jesus Christ comes back with us to take over. The same goes for the day of Christ. I don't limit it to just one certain event. I don't just limit it to the rapture. It also refers to the judgment seat of Christ. So these, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are different in that they talk about one emphasizes things for the church and the other one does not. However, the events from both of these days happen at the same time. So in that sense, it is the same day, in a sense. In Second Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. So they say, see here, the rapture can't come, except a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. So they teach that the rapture can't come before uh, the, the Antichrist shows up. Now the phrase, that day. When you cross-reference that phrase through the scriptures, it refers to the day of the Lord, the second coming. Not only this, but the context of 2 Thessalonians 2 is also the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it's not saying the rapture can't happen until a falling away and the menace be revealed. It's saying the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ where he comes back to smite the nations can't happen bef before the the man of sin be revealed. The Antichrist has to show up before Jesus Christ comes back to smite the nations. The Antichrist doesn't have to show up before he comes in the rapture. The rapture happens first. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2 1, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you something. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren. So it's a continuation of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
And guess what Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So this event involves flaming fire, people being punished with everlasting destruction, and it is it's said to be in that day. These events don't take place at the rapture when the saints are caught up. They take place at the second coming when the Lord comes down with the saints, as in Revelation 19. While the day of Christ is going on up in heaven, you have all hell breaking loose on this earth, the tribulation can be referred to as that day. Jeremiah 30 and verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So the day of the Lord can cover events in the trib all the way through to the great white throne judgment. So while the day of Christ shows you end times events concerning the church, the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ is going on up in heaven. The day of the Lord is taking place on this earth. They happen at the same time, yet they're not exactly the same. I believe that's why in some places it would say the day of Christ, some places the day of the Lord. The Thessalonians thought they missed the rapture, and they were now going to face that day. But which day? The rapture? No. They... Th they, th they thought they were going to face Jesus Christ coming back in flaming fire. When it says, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, that day refers to the day of the Lord when Jesus Christ is coming back at the second coming. And Paul is trying to re reassure them that they're not going through the tribulation because that day will not come except there's a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So he's telling the Thessalonians, since those two things have not happened, or are not happening, they're not presently going through that horrible time period. So it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter asked from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So you see there you have the event of Jesus Christ coming back in a vengeance in the context of Second Thessalonians 2 and Second Thessalonians 1. So the context has to do with the second coming, not the rapture. It's primarily about the second coming. So to deny the rapture because of 2 Thessalonians 2 is once again to take things out of context. Now the next thing, the mark of the beast proves a pre-tribulation rapture. If the church goes through that horrible future time period, then you put them at risk of taking the mark. This contradicts what Paul wrote to the church. He said in Romans 8, 38 through 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If a Christian goes through Daniel's 70th week and takes the mark, then he would get separated. And that makes no sense. The Lord isn't going to put a sealed believer in that time period. 
They insist, they insist that, that the Antichrist and his henchmen won't give a Christian the mark. However, it says in Revelation 13, he causeth all to receive it. <clears throat> so you mean to tell me that the devil would turn down damning your soul to hell if he had the chance? It says in Revelation 13, 16, and 17, and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So they also say that a true Christian would never take the mark. They say church members would, but not true Christians. Also keep in mind that these statements are coming from men who vehemently reject Lordship, salvation, and Calvinism, which I do too. And Stephen Anderson actually even preached one of the greatest sermons against Lordship, salvation that I've ever heard. It was a blessing to hear. Yet he teaches Lordship, salvation when it comes to the tribulation and getting the mark of the beast. To say that a true Christian wouldn't take the mark of the beast if he had the chance is no different than saying a true Christian wouldn't smoke dope or get shacked up today. It's Calvinism. Calvinists teach that if you are really the elect, then you will endure unto the end. Lordship Salvationists teach that if you're really saved, you won't do this or that sin. While Stephen Anderson and the New IFB would never look at a drunk and say, he can't be a true Christian since he's a drunk. They would go into the tribulation and say, a true Christian would never take the mark of the beast. That's Double speak. That's hypocrisy. Do Christians suddenly become ultra separated and spiritual if they were to go through the tribulation? I mean, Christians aren't doing much today. They live like the devil today. What makes you think all of them would turn down the mark of the beast if they went through the tribulation? The thing is, we won't be here for the tribulation. Revelation 14, 9 through 11 shows you that those who take the mark of the beast are damned. If you put a Christian through this time period, Christians would take the mark of the beast and that would contradict what Paul said in Romans 8 where it says nothing can separate us from the love of God. The saints in the tribulation who end up taking the mark are not part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ has already left the planet. The saints who end up taking the mark will not be born again. They won't be sealed unto the day of redemption and we already will have seen the day of redemption and gotten our glorified body by that point. Now next thing, the book of Revelation itself proves that the church doesn't go through the tribulation. The post-trib pre-wrath believers poke fun at the fact that we say Revelation 4 is a picture of the rapture, but it is just that, a picture. It says in Revelation 4, 1 through 2, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Of course, John was an apostle who lived back then, and of course, John ended up dying later, but will be caught up in the future pre-tribulation rapture. But what takes place here is a picture of that. What just so happens right before or right after this is Revelation 14, which talks about people casting their crowns before the throne, which could picture the judgment seat of Christ, which happens after the rapture. Then Revelation 6, it starts the seals. Revelation 6 happens after Revelation 4, so you have a picture of us getting out of here before the Lamb opens the seals, the start of the tribulation. Revelation 7 is a problem for the post-trib pre-wrath crowd who teach replacement theology because this chapter contains two separate bodies of believers instead of, them, instead of making them one in Christ Jesus, as Paul does in Galatians 3.28, where he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And Revelation 7 opens up with saints being sealed out of every tribe. The 12 tribes are Jewish. Obviously, God is not done with Israel. Replacement theology is a complete joke when you really sit down and look at it. Please look at Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Before you decide that God is done with Israel, what would be the point of him messing with the 12 tribes of Israel if he was done with Israel? 
Also, they are sealed in their foreheads. If they were born-again believers who were in the body, then they would have already been sealed. Then in Revelation 7, 9 through 17, you have a completely different group of saints who made, made it out of every nation under heaven. It says in Revelation 7, 9, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. They are said to have come out of great tribulation. And verse 14, According to the post-trib pre-wrath crowd, this is me and you the saints of today. But it's like they don't understand the fact that there will be saints, there will be believers after the church is gone. It's just that those believers aren't part of the bride of Christ. Revelation 13, 7 says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And someone asked me, well, what about that verse? If we're raptured out before the tribulation, then how does the Antichrist make a war with the saints? Well, because there are people who end up believing after we leave, but they aren't part of the body of Christ because it's a different time period altogether. A huge problem is that the new IFB do not understand the church, which is his body. They believe the church is simply a congregation or a local church. The Bible talks about local churches, but it also talks about the church, which is his body. They believe a church that is made up of all born-again believers is just Catholic. So they don't understand the church. Therefore, they put the church through the tribulation. In Revelation 11, an angel is told to measure the temple of God. In Revelation 11, 1 and 2, if God is done with Israel and the tribulation is not about Israel, then why is there temple worship? Why is there a holy city? As it talks about in Revelation 1, 2, Daniel's 70th week and the time of Jacob's trouble that we refer to as the tribulation is about the nation of Israel. It's not about the church. And if you believe that it is, if you believe the church has replaced Israel, Paul says you're conceited in Romans 11.25. And in Revelation 11.3, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. It is widely accepted that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Even by the new IFB who are post pre wrath and believe in replacement theology, what is the purpose of bringing back Moses and Elijah if God is done with the Jews? Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. Both are Jews. Yet these guys act like the Jews are completely wicked in the tribulation time period. They would blush if you called Israel the elect of Matthew 24. What about Revelation 12? You have a woman who was clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. Joseph's dream will show you this is Israel. Because in Genesis 37, 9, it says, And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. The sun represented Jacob, the moon represented Rachel, and the eleven stars were Joseph's brothers from which the tribes of Israel came. How much more clear does it have to be that your tribulation is not about the church, it is about the nation of Israel? In chapter 14, it gives you an interesting detail about the 144,000 Jewish saints. Revelation 14, 4, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So they were all male, Jewish, and virgins. Notice the emphasis on physical things. Unlike when God talks about the church, it is mostly spiritual things. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither male nor female. Galatians 3.28 If God is done with Israel today, then why does the twelve gates of New Jerusalem have the names of the twelve tribes in Revelation 21? God is done with Israel? you got to be kidding me. Revelation 21, 12 shows you the twelve gates of New Jerusalem have the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Now the next thing, are post-trib pre-rathers more prepared than pre-tribbers? They mention how pre-tribbers will many times use more slogans than scriptures to go against the pre-wrath position. I do see that a lot. I'm fair. I do see that. I've heard the pre-trib preacher many times say, you can go through the tribulation if you want to, but I'm getting out of here. 
And they say things like that. Many times they are too lazy to get in the scriptures and really show the people how the pre-trib position is right. And many people are pre-trib and have no idea why. For that very reason, the pastors aren't teaching them. However, the pre-wrath guys also use cute little sayings to go against us. They say that we think we're getting out of here lickety-split, and for that reason, we aren't preparing ourselves for the tribulation. But let me ask you this. What are you doing that makes you so much more prepared? Are you storing food? Are you exercising and staying in tip-top shape to fight a thousand of the workers of iniquity that's going to come against you? Are you going to take on 300 men at once like David's mighty men? bodily exercise profiteth little according to paul and death would be a welcome guest compared to facing death on a pale horse and hell following with him i mean paul had a desire to depart and to be with christ which is far better why do you make all the fuss about preparing physically and if you're meaning spiritually prepared then how are you any better spiritually there are pre-tribbers who are so winners. There are pre-tribbers who study and read the Bible. Do you think that you are more spiritual, prepared than a pre-tribber because you believe in the pre-wrath rapture? I think that is what most of this is about. I could be wrong, but I believe Stephen Anderson wants so badly to be greater than your favorite preacher that he has spent years trying to make himself out to be the greatest and more spiritual. I heard one of them say the pre-tribbers are unprepared. They're looking for Jesus Christ instead of the Antichrist. Well, yeah. Where does it say we're supposed to look for the Antichrist to show up? They say that is one of our little slogans. They say we're always saying we're looking for Jesus Christ and they're looking for Antichrist. That may be a cute little saying, but it is a fact. You are looking for the Antichrist first. They think we would just roll over and die. If we went through the tribulation, they think they are so much better and so much more spiritual. And that is what this has become. It is a pride fest. The pride when they preach and teach about the pre trib or the pre wrath rapture. And they talk about this doctrine. It shows they are eat up with it. They mock us. They put us down the entire time. They act like we would just give in, lay down and give up in the tribulation. And a lot of us probably will. But a lot of them probably believe would too. But the thing is, I've showed you, the church does not go through the tribulation. 